Hello. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jürgen Steinmetz. I'm uh, joining you from uh, beautiful Hawaii. I'm not at the beach. It's, actually, it's dark here right now. It's nine in the evening, but this is the view from our uh, beautiful North Shore where I lived for almost 30 years. So it's kind of my, my second home territory after Germany. Um, it's been a wonderful day here in Hawaii. The beaches are back open. Um, most of the shops are still closed. Uh, we're supposed to stay in-house unless we want to go to the beach and surfing, uh, but we're doing fine. Uh, to start, I will mute all the microphones, but if you, you're in control of the microphone, so when you're speaking, you can actually unmute yourself. The only thing I'm asking, if there are questions, we want to keep this interactive, just raise your hand. There's a blue button, uh, what is, means you're raising your hand. And uh, we will see this here and let you uh, on as soon as possible. Uh, but let me just mute everyone so this way we don't have all this background noise, okay? Okay, so I think we are okay. So I'm going to just unmute. Um, Elaine, and, uh, and give me one second here. I don't know what happened to Tom Jenkins, but hang on. I... Oh, here it is. Okay. You can, so you can um, um, unmute yourself, Tom. Uh, yeah, no, yes. yeah, I got it. Okay, no problem. Good. Again, so now officially, good morning. It's nice and quiet here in the background. Thanks uh, for joining us. Um, currently, we have 88 people online. We're expecting actually quite a few more. Uh, we have a total registration of 340, and I know not everyone will probably attend, uh, but everyone wanted the video at the end. And um, uh, it's, it's uh, quite an exciting, very international crowd. And instead of just pointing, there's so many familiar faces and non-familiar faces. Um, let me go through the list of countries um, that have registered for tonight's event. Um, for up, just wanted to let you know, rebuilding dot travel. We are on the roll. Uh, currently, uh, we have uh, members in 107 countries, and we have 522 members, including uh, ministers of tourism, heads of tourism boards, hotel chains, and everyone else that joined us. And just is only within three weeks, so we're just now getting started. On this call, according to the list. We have people from Australia, from Bangladesh, from Belgium, from Canada, from China, Croatia, Egypt, Ethiopia, France, Germany, Ghana, Greece, Hong Kong, Japan, Guam, India, Israel, Italy, Jamaica, Japan, Jordan, Kenya, Malaysia, Mexico, Mauritius, Micronesia, Monaco, Namibia, Nepal, Nigeria, uh, the, Nether uh, the Netherlands, North Macedonia, Oman, Pakistan, Poland, Russia, Rwanda, Saudi Arabia, the Seychelles, Singapore, Sierra Leone, South Africa, Sri Lanka, St. Lucia, Spain, Syria, Tanzania, Thailand, Turkey, the UAE, Uganda, the UK, and here also from the United States. So welcome everyone um, on board. It is really great to have uh, so many people registered for today's event and I'm, I'm sure it'll be, it's gonna be quite interesting. Also, I wanted to say a special hello to um, members uh, re that registered from Marriott Hotel, Hyatt, IHG, the Hilton Group, Barcelona, and Warwick Hotels. These are the ones I saw. Uh, we have the Boutique Lifestyle and Leaders Association, uh, IIPT in Australia registered. We have people from Reed Expo and uh, from uh, Fairfest uh, uh, registered. And, um, and of course, with us as always is uh, Dr. Taleb Rifai, uh, Taleb, of course, you know, was the former Secretary General for two terms at the United Nations World Tourism Organization, but I'm, I'm sure almost all of you know this. Um, we have um, Alain St. Ange. Saint Alain um, has been a good friend and has been attending, I think, almost every event we had. He's currently running for president of the Seychelles. So wish him good luck. He's the, he's the next. He's the, he's the next president. He is the next president in the Seychelles. Yes. So we definitely want him to succeed because we need a head of state in our um, group here. We have our uh, 
very special welcome to Tom Jenkins. Tom is the head of ETOA, the European Tour Operator Association, uh, uh, joining us from London. And uh, we have Raid Habis, and I think he has some difficulties coming in. He will be speaking later, joining from uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, without further ado, maybe I wanted to uh, give the microphone to Alain for just a few words, because um, becoming a president is not an easy task. And he said he may have to leave us a little bit early today. Um, so Alain, welcome. Thank you very much. Good morning to everybody, or good afternoon, depending on where we are. Today, what I wanted to mention before Tom takes the floor is just to appeal to the community of nations. This dilemma of COVID-19 has arrived without invitation from anybody. It is beyond politics. This week, uh, we were informed in one of our African Tourism Board uh, meetings, the HOPE project, that Europe has voted a sizable amount of money for Europe to consolidate itself and to tackle this pandemic and how to revive from it. My message to the world today and to every delegate here, that we should look at it on a, on a world scale. No zones, no part of any zones can survive alone. The European airlines will need to fly into Africa or the islands of Africa as it needs to fly to the area of Asia and so on. The whole world is in trouble, but it is together that we will survive. It is together that we will ride the storm. We know we all have different boats in this open ocean. Some are in cruise ships, others are in small sailing boats, others are in rowing, rowing boats. But together, as we all face the heavy seas ahead, we can succeed if we work as one, or at least with the bodies that make it happen. If we look at the Hope Project of Africa, it is an example. An example how 54 states can rally together to try and look how to bring Africa to life post-COVID. But COVID is going nowhere. We know that it'll be there with or without vaccines. WHO has told us. So we need to mitigate the, the different areas so that we can look at the people of our continents, countries, villages, and together make a step exactly. forward. Exactly. I thank Dr. Rifai, exactly. who's Inside been the door, chairman. Outside, even though you can get outside. Dr. Rifai, who's been the chairperson of the Hope Project of Africa. Together, him, myself as his co-chair, we are making headway and we will hopefully, in the coming weeks, make some announcements how we can change the lives of many in Africa. Thank you very much and let's have a good meeting together. Thank you very, very much, uh, yeah. Alena. Uh, be, before we move on, I also wanted to recognize uh, VJ and VJ. I'm so sorry. I'm not even going to try to pronounce your last name. <laughs> well, no, <laughs> and I know how that feels. Many people don't try that either with me. Uh, but VJ was one of our speakers uh, a while ago. He's an expert in the aviation industry. He's based in Singapore, used to be a VP, VP for Etihad Airways. And um, He's not on our role of speakers, but I think he can probably um, uh, kind of uh, get in uh, if there are issues coming up in regards to aviation, and um, I'm sure there will. Um, now, if, um, I know there is Omar Navas. I don't know, Omar, you raised your hand if there's anything what has to do with introduction. Um, let me just unmute you real quick and, and let me know um, if was this a question or a comment. Uh, you raised your hand. Go ahead, Omar. Actually, it, it was a question that I raised earlier, so it was not a comment, and I hope Hi, you'll Omar. be able to tackle it. Hi, how are you? Good oh, to fine, see you. Fine, no much pleasure to see you. You know, Dr. Rifai, I am stuck in Paris and unable to get back to Madrid. Uh, I came here just before the, the call, and now I am unable to get back there. Of course, your family is with you. Bit. Uh, yes, I'm. I'm with my family, but the children are all away. Okay. Uh, my question that I raised earlier is a question uh, pertains to the measures that are being taken by different countries. I sure. feel that there is a kind of selective ah. discrimination. Why I raised the question? 
How is that? Mm-hmm. How anyway, is that? Uh, um, the thing is, each country seems to be trying to do the best, but at the same time, by doing their efforts, sometimes other countries are adversely affected by this. So ultimately, it will come to a question like the WTTC race. Okay. Hi, Robert. Okay. And I'm sorry, guys. Maybe what we can do is put this question a little bit later because we have speakers today and I don't want to um, interrupt their thoughts because we're ready to start. But Omar, maybe we can put at the end, we have a Q&A for everyone. Um, okay. And uh, then maybe we can entertain your question, whether we can help or not. I don't know, but it's an interesting subject. Um, Tom, the floor is yours. Welcome. Well, thank uh, you very much for attending. Well, uh, thank you so much, Jürgen. And um, thank you, Alan, for a um, really rather moving and beautiful um, introduction you gave. Uh, it's very tough to follow on from uh, a skilled politician uh, putting forward uh, a vision for the world industry. But uh, here I am uh, sitting in London uh, trying to run a trade association that sells Europe throughout the world. Um, it's quite, it was quite heartening to hear your words. Um, I'm not going to occupy the airways for too long, I hope. Um, I've just got a few points I'd like to make. Um, I think the first thing to say is that we all know that this is an extraordinary and unique crisis that faces the tourism industry. Um, I now recognize that I've been working in the industry the best part of 35 to 40 years. I've never seen anything like this. And I don't think anybody alive has seen anything as severe and as critical as what we're facing at the moment. And I think this is global. And it's global because the coronavirus is a global pandemic. And I think on one level, and I'll get back to why this is heartening at the end, I hope, is we should recognize that it is everywhere. It is not isolated. It is more or less running as a highly infectious contagion throughout the world. I think I speak from Europe, which was the first region to be deeply affected by the medical impact of coronavirus. It obviously originated in Wuhan in China, but they contained it as best they could and did so extremely well. Europe is the first country, is the first region where we've seen really a massive outbreak and significant quantities of fatality. Um, And what we've seen is that the nation states of Europe have reacted as nation states. We've not seen um, a coordinated response from the supranational body of the European Union. It's very difficult for them to do so in a crisis. They're not set up to cope with such a crisis. And each the, the political class, the pe- political people running countries have reacted in a way which is, was suitable for their, was suitable for the way in which they address their electorate. And this means that they become intensely national, not supranational. And they look to, they look to sort of, they, they look to pander almost to nationalist impulses. I find it absolutely extraordinary that people in Canada are being offered emergency evacuation from Europe into Canada at the same time as the various nations of Europe are emer- uh, issuing emergency repatriating flights from Canada back to Europe. I suppose in times of crisis, people think of home. In such a circumstance, the political um, all the politics and all the press attention and and thus all the social media attention has been on mitigating disease. I think this attention is frankly going to be last month's story fairly shortly. Because I think what we're witnessing is something which is far, far more significant than coronavirus, which is the impact of coronavirus, or more properly, the impact of the way that governments have chosen to handle coronavirus. Because what they've chosen to do is effectively close down their service economies. And one of the things we will find is the extraordinary importance of tourism will start emerging 
when they realize what damage has been caused to their service economies by the closure of tourism. It is very interesting that this is slowly starting to dawn across Europe. Countries which two to three or four weeks ago were talking of quarantine measures, were talking of total lockdowns, were talking about the end of the tourism season in 2020, suddenly are opening up their borders. Italy has been very explicit. They said we cannot afford not to have a tourism industry in Italy this summer, and therefore we have to go ahead with this risk. Spain, who hitherto had been making noises about expecting no tourism at all this year, is starting to open up its borders. Portugal is doing so. Greece is doing so. So we're slowly seeing a rollback of the um, stringent measures that we've been seeing over the last three to four months, over the last two months, in the main destinations of Europe. And I think this is a response to their realization of the enormous economic damage which is being caused. I say this as London, of course, uh, UK always being an exception, and London is where I'm based, um, the government has decided to uh, implement a quarantine measure on people coming into the UK. <clears throat> it's not the place nor the time to analyze the folly behind this, um, this move. Suffice to say that what they're doing is gonna have huge repercussions. Because if you look at London, and London is a fairly robust economic entity on world terms, but if you look at the West End, foreign visitors represent 25% of the footfall in the West End, but 50% of the spend. They re represent something like 85% of the occupancy of hotels, 30 to, thir 30 to 40% of the occupancy of theatres. I could go on. What they're proposing by killing inbound tourism in London is effectively economic catastrophe in the heart of the capital. Um, I don't think this policy will survive very long, but they, they can even countenance it, shows how risk mitigation in terms of medicine is currently trumping economic reality. So, in such circumstances, it's entirely natural, uh, and we are still in an environment where we are all worried about coronavirus and doing everything we can to, to mitigate its impact. In such an environment, it's entirely natural for the tourism industry to be working, uh, working to try and establish protocols, standards, and methodologies by which we can accommodate clients in a reassuring way in times of coronavirus. And I am working at the moment with the Canadian Tour Operators Association and the US Tour Operators Association, and indeed WTTC um, we are working with, to look to see if we can produce protocols that act as some kind of reassuring measure for clients. There is huge demand for this throughout the industry. I think that too will become yesterday's story because social distancing, um, caution, fear, are not components that work in travel. I cannot see how social distancing, well, we know social distancing cannot function on aircraft. We know that cannot, not economically, it cannot function on aircraft. We know that airports cannot function on social distancing. Someone dryly pointed out that if you did social distancing on a queue for a 747 jet, the line would be one kilometer long and don't even go what the line would look like to get through security. And so airports and airlines cannot function on that level. Restaurants will find it extremely difficult to function on that level. Bars cannot function on that level. Shops cannot function on that level. We're not being sensible. Well, we're being entirely sensible addressing this, but in terms of the core practicalities, I think we have to realize that at the end of the day, what we have to have is a client base that thinks the experience of travel is worth the risk. And on that note, I think I will hand you back to Jürgen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very good insight. Um, I think Talib raised his hand and Talib is also going to uh, talk a little bit maybe in this contents about uh, his initiative with the COVID uh, resilient zone. But Talib, you, you raised the hand first. Um, Thank you so much, Jorgen. No, I just wanted to comment on one thing. 
But if it's my chance to speak, I will speak of Zoom. Now, I want to comment on this issue of international versus local. I thank Alan first, our next president of Seychelles, to have started the, the talk in this way. I believe that the, the, the time and the age of international organization has ended. I think that the, the original way of working together as nations is not working anymore. We don't hear about the European Union anymore. We don't hear about the United Nations even anymore. So I think each country is on its own now. We have to rebuild our international system from bottom up now, from now on. These are one of the things that are changing in the post-corona zone. Now, I think the post-corona zone is going to be quite different, definitely. One of the most important issues here is the fact that uh, the, uh, the small countries have proved to be more capable of dealing with the first phase, it's the containment phase, what you want to, whatever you want to call it, the medical phase, containment phase, I call it. Containment phase has been dealt better in developing countries than in, in developed countries. Somehow it showed the weaknesses of developed countries. But that's not to say that they are not going to be able to catch up with us. Now, I think there are two phases to this thing, containment phase and the recovery phase. The recovery phase now is skimming up, and it's what's going to reveal all our weaknesses and strengths. We need to do this together, definitely. There's no way other than doing that. In the whole project, we have identified four areas that we should redirect the tourism industry into. Number one is domestic tourism, domestic and regional tourism. That's step number one, because we have bypassed domestic tourism for a long period of time. It's not because it's the right thing to do, the only option that we have now for immediate work. It's also because it's the right thing to do. For a long time, we have overlooked domestic tourism. I believe, I always say this, there is no future for a country that does not have its people enjoy it before visitors enjoy it first. The people of the country must learn how to live, how to travel, how to enjoy their country. This is a complete change in attitudes and in promotion and in the skills of workers, everything. The second thing is technology. Technology has uh, changed our life upside down. Everything is virtual. We're meeting here from, you said 108 countries in one place, we're all at home. Some of us are not even wearing proper and decent clothes, but we're still meeting. <laughs> I, I'm not talking about you, Tim, of course. You're, you're, you're the most handsome amongst us all. But the fact is that technology has changed everything. Everything has become remote. So we have to start thinking imaginatively of how to do this. I have a daughter that's getting married. She was supposed to get married last July, next July. She can't do it anymore. We're going to do it virtual now. She lives in Dubai. I'm going to be here. She's going to be there. We can't treat each other. And there's going to be a priest online. That's the effect, reality of life we're going to have to live with. The third thing is safety and security. Safety and security is very, very important. Because as uh, Tom said also, Tim, the, the perception of security is more important than security itself. Remember after September 11, we, I still remember the days where I used to re leave my car, walk to the airplane without having to go through any security checks. Now I have to take off my shoes, take off my belt, rid myself from all liquids, go through lots of, of, of indecency, if I may say so. Now all of this has become part of our lives. I think we're going to add to that protocols much more now regarding health safety. We're going to have to live with that. Not for now, not for tomorrow, for a long period of, of time also. We have to prepare ourselves for that. But the most important thing about safety and security now is to produce these protocols. To come up with a concept of CRV, Corona Resilient Zones. I spoke about this last time, but I think, uh, Jorgen, you want me to explain this a little bit? to this group of people, just in case there are some people that were not attend last meeting. Coronial resilience zone, CRV, are geographic zones that every country can designate. These must have specific geographic limitations. They must have control on exit and entry. There must be an airport or a port or, or a land connection to them that's controlled very well. And this zone will have to issue a special, special protocol for itself. It should be producing very good results internally first. And then this zone would, it's not a whole country, unless the country is an island, can declare itself a zone, but it's a zone within, within any country. This zone can start now 
producing some contacts with other zones and create a direct line of contact. That's the only way to start international travel. Because what you need to do is put the people's minds at rest. People are worried. Even if governments say you can travel now, people aren't going to travel because they're worried about what happened. So you need to, to reassure them by protocols, by certifying these protocols, by announcing yourself as a corona reserve and zone, CRV. We've done that in Aqaba in Jordan. Let's see, Aqaba is an area that had seen zero now cases for the last month. But that can change. However, Aqaba has its own airport. So we have now agreements with some airline to bring people directly from their destinations to Aqaba. From Aqaba, they can go visit Petra, visit the Wadi Ram with a certain protocol. It's a very, very complicated protocol, but it has to be followed. Last thing I want to talk about is the training and uh, rehabilitation, because all of this new environment is going to produce now a whole new set of skills. Our workforce does not and cannot continue to work the way it does now. It has to be learned how to, how to clean themselves, how the sanitation is an issue, how to deal with the psychology of the, of the, the tourists and the visit, visitors. So we have to embark on a large and huge retraining program. We're doing all this in, this is in short and in, in a nutshell, what the whole project is of Africa. It's a whole project that now we're working with Uzbekistan, with Egypt, I have a call with the minister from Egypt now in a couple of hours to discuss how we can implement this country, country by country. No international or regional organizations are going to help us anymore. That's what I wanted to say. And thank you so much, Jorgen, for inviting us and for putting all of this together. Thank you. Thank you, Talib. Um, I appreciate it. I know Professor uh, Demetrius raised his hand. Uh, uh, we, we get to you in just a minute. I wanted to introduce, um, or not introduce, just recognize a very good friend of mine, Pilar Laguna. I just saw her online. She's the head of the Guam Tourism Board. And, yes, um, of course. Um, and Pilar um, sent us a note a while ago that she's retiring. Um, but I'm glad to see you here, Pilar, and I hope you're going to going to stay um, to bigger and, and even greater things in the tourism um, industry. And I think Guam might be a perfect example for a tourism resilient zone. Thank you for attending, Pilar. Um, we have uh, Professor Dimitrius um, raised his hand. I think he's joining us from London. Thank you. I just wanted to ask uh, Thomas, uh, if he has any indication in terms of uh, charter flights uh, out of the UK, do you think, Tom, that they're going, charter flights are going to resume flying? Uh, I guess that, that, that scheduled flights are going to go, but what about charters? Uh, Dimitri, you should know that. That's one of the areas which I don't know anything about. I have actually no idea. Um, um, one of the pieces of data that we've got, which is not directly about flights. There are going to be aviation people on this call. One of the things I should have stressed is that the good news is that latent demand in all the main origin markets for Europe is, according to my members, really quite robust. We have a lot of people who were scheduled to uh, have their holidays here in 2020, have obviously delayed, but are rebooking for 2021. And there is, there is no diminution in the volume of inquiries on holidays, nor, according to TripAdvisor, was, were there any, were there any? any, any shortfall on, um, uh, or, or minor shortfall on the level of inquiries. So the interest in travel is still there. People are still making inquiries. Pe people are still trying to book. So I, I think you know, the underlying demand that we're catering for is still there. I think it's still quite robust and there, there is grounds for optimism. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vijay may, may have a, a view on this in terms of airlines. Um, if, 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 if you see um, schedule, schedule airlines obviously are going to uh, resume flying, but what about charter airlines? I don't know if, if Vijay may have a view on this. Well, may I add to that, here. please, jo Jorgen? Can I add yeah. to that question so Vijay can? Sure. Also, I think pri private jets will become more popular as well. Yeah. I think yeah. for business yeah. people and uh, private jets will become more and more used to now. So I'd like Vijay to, to respond to both the charter airlines and the private jets as well. Thank you. Vijay, you are unmuted. We put you on the spot here. Yeah. 
<laughs> Thank you very much. Sorry. <laughs> no, I, th I think the, the, the reality is uh, aviation, uh, basically COVID-19 has clipped the wings of aviation, grounded tourism, and that's, that's a fact. How things will evolve is really a, a matter of, of conjecture. Uh, because at the end of the day, th there's no base case to what we're talking about here. We've never been here before. No one knows how this will play out. Uh, but one thing is sure, and all of us in this call are very passionate about uh, travel and tourism, but I think we should be uh, very careful about how the world has changed in the last couple of months and how it is still changing. So much so that maybe our, our passion for our industry uh, can actually be unhelpful in these circumstances. The reason I say this is, is that because uncertainty, and there's a lot of uncertainty out there, and perceived self-interest breed fear, mistrust, and loss of confidence. When the airlines are going to get back to the air will very much depend on the level of confidence amongst the general public and amongst governments, not the level of confidence amongst airlines or amongst airline associations. And I think that's where we need to be very careful because if we're trying to build up confidence again, we need to be very sensitive about people's perceptions, about people's uh, fears, and about uh, not allowing our passion to be misinterpreted as a focus on protecting a business. We need to be seen to be protecting the community, we need to be seen to be protecting socioeconomic growth, but not to be seen as protecting a business interest. And that's key in terms of how our messaging will come, come through to people uh, out there. And certainly for me, uh, I mean, as I said, the, the uh, Boeing CEO, the Airbus CEO, I've talked about a, a range of three to five years before the airline business can get back to where it was last year. But certainly I think it will start. And I think I agree with Taleb in the sense that there's probably better opportunity once the governments get their act together in a coordinated way in terms of setting out the protocols which will be in place, that private jets are likely to be uh, off the grounds earlier than anybody else, uh, followed by scheduled airlines and last by charter airlines. And, and uh, Vijay, may I, if I, I may ask, I mean, with the recent development in the aviation industry, not only here in North America, but also with Lufthansa uh, possibly going into bankruptcy proceedings, airlines um, may be required to observe so, um, social distancing and not looking at the profits for the airlines. How, what airlines would actually survive this? I mean, the, the odds are uh, in the current circumstances, if there are, for example, no um, uh, funds coming into airlines, I, I suspect uh, most airlines would not be able to survive in the current circumstances. Uh, because we know it. I mean, each aircraft sitting on the ground is costing the airline uh, millions of dollars. And, and if the longer COVID-19 chokes the world, the long, uh, longer the airlines uh, are going to have to suffer and may not uh, recover at all. Obviously, money coming in uh, uh, will help, but money coming in whilst the aircraft remain on the ground is not going to help for long. No. And you're going to have a challenge between communities now wondering why would governments be pouring money into airlines which are grounded when there may be other more pressing uh, needs in the community. So you're going to start a different discussion as to whether airlines should be uh, funded. So I think uh, what governments need to do is work out what is a sensible path for getting the airlines uh, back in the air. But I think that needs to be done very carefully and very uh, with great sensitivity because there cannot be a notion that airlines or even governments are willing to make a compromise here between getting the airlines in the air and taking some uh, risk with uh, health. It cannot be a compromise. It has to be, health will always be the prevailing factor, 
given that prevailing factor, what are the conditions which are necessary to ensure that the airlines get back to the air by respecting international protocols and able to do so safely? I mean, that's going to be the, the real crux. And I think everybody can should focus on that. What are the conditions which will build that level of confidence amongst people and governments to allow the airlines to get back in the air? So it, would that be the end for the low-cost carriers and for low-cost travel, maybe? Not necessarily, because he, uh, low-cost carriers have traditionally been very careful about their, their costs, which means that their ability to actually withstand uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the clampdown uh, may be a little bit longer than scheduled airlines, which have historically have had larger uh, exposures financially. But it would all depend on whether the low-cost airlines have been, again, leasing their aircraft, have been uh, basically owning their aircraft. So uh, without knowing the details of each of these airlines, you wouldn't be able to know how long can they withstand. But when things get back on track, let's say, uh, it's clear that the, 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 the airlines going forward if I will will obviously need to cut down on the cost of operations. Uh, so the service level is going to change, uh, whether it's COVID related or it's uh, economically related. The fact is uh, the, the kind of experience we've had in the past from scheduled airlines in particular will inevitably change. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting times. Um, I want to move on and uh, maybe open up the floor for question after we hear from Raid Habis. Uh, Raid is joining us from Saudi Arabia and he's going to give us a quick overview um, and his feedback on how everything is in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Welcome Raid, you can unmute yourself. Let me help you. I... Thank you, uh, Jürgen, and good morning everyone. I hope that I hope there is a voice. There is a voice. Yes, thank we you. We can hear you. Welcome. Assalamu okay. alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Alaikum assalam. Alaikum assalam. Shukran, Dr. Talib. Uh, glad to be meeting with you again, uh, Ergen and Dr. Talib and all the colleagues of this Rebuilding Travel uh, Initiative. Actually, I listened to what. Uh, Mr. Tim stated as a, a, uh, representing as the European tour operator, the trade channel, and also the, on the other perspective, what Dr. Talib also stated, uh, that uh, there are uh, initiatives that certain organization, they are trying to work around government. And as it clearly, Dr. Talib stated, uh, I've been also doing some contacts with governments and with IATA. And uh, up to yesterday, uh, there are a big initiative with IATA and WHO, uh, ICAO, uh, ACI, and uh, uh, WHO. Uh, they already prepared a strategy and agenda uh, uh, for uh, 21 countries in the MENA region. And they've been working with uh, other region of the world in uh, North America, in Europe, in Asia, Africa, and the MENA region. Uh, as uh, Dr. Talib stated, that uh, uh, this all will depend on each government uh, uh, which will uh, override or proceed any uh, international uh, presidents or uh, initiatives. Uh, the local governments will have to uh, evaluate the uh, risk and do a, a risk mitigation and they will, based on that, depend when they will open up the scare view. Uh, according to the information and to the source, unfortunately, uh, it's not going to be 
recovered as we all hope or wish. It will take uh, at least maybe to the first quarter of uh, uh, 2021, and they are working and trying to lobby with governments to try to ease on uh, the procedure, and especially like uh, 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 what I listened that uh, the distance, uh, social distancing in the aircraft. IATA, they are trying not to make uh, an empty seat, and because of economical reason, that will uh, burden the airline and also will raise the fares. And uh, again, um, to get the trust of the traveler and the tourist again, uh, it's not going to be an easy job. So, according to their strategy now, they are working with governments uh, to. Uh, uh, simulate or to uh, finance uh, airlines and especially since airlines will lo lose a lot of jobs uh, during uh, this crisis. Uh, uh, in North America already they got that support, some European countries and uh, some African countries. This is according to the knowledge I received yesterday. They are now working with MENA region airline and governments uh, to try to get the government to support them by giving them uh, free interest loans, uh, giving them uh, uh, or waiving uh, taxes or overflight uh, permission costs in airports when they're flying over countries. Uh, they're also trying to get uh, support to pay for the staff, uh, the airline staff to work uh, until, you know, uh, for the next three years till the industry uh, revive and flourish again. But uh, it will not be like anything like 2019 and it's a, a quick recovery. It's going to take some time, but the strategy like what uh, Dr. Talib said, it's going to be to <clears throat> focus in the interim period, maybe for the rest of 2020, uh, domestic airport will, and domestic flights and to, domestic tourism will, uh, will work again. So uh, on the overall, up to now, they have uh, not been satisfied, they have not found a satisfactory cure uh, for testing uh, COVID-19 at uh, airports uh, with the high accuracy rate. According to their uh, study and research, the test kit that they have tested, they didn't prove that accurate. The accuracy rate was about 50%. So uh, this is what's scaring government, you know, to reopen uh, uh, travel and tourism. However, there are countries which they have their own policies, like Emirates, for example. Uh, they will start uh, 11 uh, destinations, <clears throat> international destination to Europe, to Middle East, and to Asia. So uh, uh, it all now uh, depends on how each government will work. The other uh, also challenge they have uh, is that uh, uh, once they arrive at that destination, they have to be either quarantined for two weeks or minimum of one week, which I don't think any tourist want to put himself in that position. So this is another issue the, that the airlines are facing challenge, or let's say the tourism uh, will, will face uh, challenge till the uh, government, uh, they make sure that they are uh, working on a very safety, precautionary uh, uh, measures. Uh, I hope I give a quick brief and overview of uh, the MENA region, uh, aviation, and how it will revive. And uh, if you have any question, I'm ready to answer. Thank you for giving me the time. Thank you very much, Raid. A, a very good insight. 
And um, it, I think the world is, is looking in a lot of ways uh, to your part of the world and the Gulf region uh, when it comes to lead for testing um, um, how to board flights. And our Emirates started, I think, being one of the first airlines um, with uh, tests for every passenger boarding flights. Uh, there has been a lot of uh, feedback on the chat group. Um, I haven't been able really to read through all of it, but uh, now it's the time for questions. So if anyone has any question, even if you made a comment here, it's hard. There's a lot of um, feedback on the chat. It might be easier if you just raise their hand and uh, let me give the uh, microphone to, is it Lefteris? Um, Sergidis, and I probably pronounced uh, this wrong. Let me unmute. <laughs> Hello, guys. Hello, everybody. Once uh, again, uh, Jürgen, uh, congratulations on uh, this uh, forum. Um, maybe. First of all, uh, what I wanted to say is that uh, I've, I've had everybody talking today from um, from um, Taleb uh, to Alan to Thomas. Um, what I see here is that we are just talking about government, we're talking about what they should be doing now, or what they are doing now. Yes, it's good to hear what is going on in the world, but maybe, maybe, just maybe, we should um, make a forum of what is the next step, what should the hoteliers, the tourism industries, the, destina the, the travel agents, the destinations of the world, the destinations, um, M uh, DMCs, what they should be doing after the COVID. Maybe we should be looking at the day after. Right now, what is going on around the globe is fear. And that is just plain fear. Fear of traveling, fear of using the airplanes, fear of going into a hotel. Let's find or let's advise people what should be done, what technology yeah. is there, what uh, the hoteliers should be doing, how they should be cleaning, in order to then put it up and say to the world, this is what we've done, you can feel safe, come it's over. Because when this finishes, when the whole thing finishes, then we will have to find ways to communicate and say, as a hotelier, as a DMC, as an airline, we should say what we have done in order to make it for the people to feel secure and just get rid of that fear in order to travel. Um, I would suggest, uh, sorry for this, but I would suggest that maybe we can address a forum where there will be solutions for the day after, or second, not only solutions, but also give a, a, an opportunity to companies which have technologies or uh, other, um, I've, I've been reading the, the, the feedback here, or um, other solutions that they have in mind for the day after, or regarding the meta searches, or regarding the social media, things like that. Uh, maybe we should do that. Um, I don't believe in uh, creating more fear by doing the CRV, because then if you, if you, if you, if you give, to people more um, to think about. A, we are doing this in order to, uh, you know, we are doing only um, these areas that, or corridors uh, that um, flights can go through. Then you create more fear. We have to live with this COVID. It's, it's a fact. There is, there are certain facts in this, in this whole story. Sorry for if I'm taking too long, but there are certain facts in this story. There is 350,000 dead, that's 0.004% of the world out of the 7.5 billion. There is $600 billion lost in the tourism industry so far, and we're looking at losing much, much more going into trillions. So right now, we need to find the way for the day after, otherwise we will suffer for years. We need to do it now and not not, not tomorrow. We need to find, uh, to have these kind of forums that will help the people to recover the fastest possible. As far as, as, far as local tourism, domestic tourism, hey, okay, domestic tourism is, is only five, six percent. No hotel will be able to survive with domestic tourism within their own country. 
no hotelier. Some hotels, I mean, I've been talking to hoteliers saying, oh, in our area, out of the 100 hotels, four will open in order that will economically be able to survive, the rest will not. We need to find ways. And that is what this forum, I believe we should do a forum with the solutions and not just discussing what is going on. We know what is going on. And the most of it is just fear, 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 fear. Nothing else. Sorry for taking uh, your time like this, but I just needed to say what I felt. No, no, and it was very, very good, good feedback. Uh, uh, also, I wanted to mention after uh, you hang up from this forum, there will be a short survey or poll, and this is exactly the information I think you can add to it because it's how we move forward with this forum. Uh, we have uh, now met three times, and it, I agree with you. It's time to um, uh, to come to action with projects, there are, there, with ideas. There are two and, things. There are two things, Jürgen. One discussing solutions for the day after to let small companies worldwide or invite companies to come and present here what they are doing. Booking.com, come and present what is your intention. Uh, TripAdvisor, what are you doing? Come and present. Technology companies, do you have something new? Come and present. Then people will get ideas of what they should be doing. Hoteliers will get ideas. How am I going to do the check-in, the check-out with without having the interaction to make people feel safe. Things like that. So let them come and present it so people will get ideas of what they should be doing or what should they adapt the day after. Sorry. No, again. no, you're absolutely right. And maybe that's something you can help us with uh, to put to put in place. Um, uh, Talib uh, raised this. Thank you very much. And I will contact you. Uh, Talib, uh, go ahead. Thank you so much. I'm very, very delighted of this discussion because this provokes us all to think differently from what we're thinking. But the facts are there. First of all, we're working with governments because the decision is in the hands of governments now, like it or not. The governments decided to lock down. We just paid the price for it. I'm very much for the private sector and the initiatives of the private sector. But if the government insists, for example, that anybody that comes to London, anybody that comes to any country would have to go to 14 days quarantine, nobody's going to come. It's a government's decision, so we have to work with governments. Unfortunately, that's a fact. Second point is, there is no day after, my dear friend. We are going to live with this for a long time. It's the, we are living it. It's not, it's not something that will go away. It's something we have to get used to. This is my complete belief. I agree with you totally. I agree okay. totally. We will, now, it, it is the new tourism right way of now. life. We yes, are living yes. with it. We will live exactly. with it. Exactly. Now, why are we talking about domestic tourism? Because domestic tourism is a quick way out now. It's not an ultimate solution. It's not an ultimate solution for sure. But we have to start thinking of domestic tourism and to revitalize it. We have not paid attention to the domestic tourism in the past because international tourism was, was making up for everything. Now, I know that there is much more demand, supply than there is demand in this. But we can increase the demand in domestic. Domestic tourism is not just about people wanting to go and have a good time. Domestic tourism is visiting relatives and friends. It's going and seeing other places, other people. It's going to for medical reasons, for educational reasons, domestic and regional tourism. I think we cannot bypass that. Now, once we've done that good, keep some life, then the hotels must look into international tourism. And international tourism, the reason why I suggested the CRB is not because it's the best way. Of course not. I completely agree with you. Fear is controlling everybody. But fear is there whether we like it or not. Even if governments now are going to say, you can travel, people are not going to travel. We need to impose on the ground some protocols that would instate confidence, not just because it's the right thing to do, it's also because it's the right state of mind to approach things. We have to install protocols. Now, again, I want to go to the example of September 11. Now, nobody wants to board an airplane that does not check him, even though it's easier not to be checked as, as used to be before 2001. No, nobody's going to board an aeroplane if it's not clean 100%. I think airlines are going to compete with each other of who's cleanest, who's more sanitized. And we don't only have to do that. We have to show the people that we've done that. That's why I suggested the concept of certification. Certification will have to be there. You have to enter a hotel and see, see a sign there saying this hotel is certified by so-and-so, Forbes or IT, United Nations, whatever it is. 
that, that this hotel has been sanitized. This, hotel. this is the only way to install confidence in people. I know that what you're asking for is very correct, but we can't just go from one extreme to another extreme. Khaled, can't just open Khaled, up completely. Uh, may I interrupt here? Please. Just for you to understand, uh, yesterday I've sent an email to all my hotels. We've got about 300 hotels in Africa, Middle East. Um, yes. And I told the hotels, you need to bring out badges certifying the cleanliness, the sanitation, exactly. the safety, exactly. the hygiene, the social distancing. Then Even if it's for the looks of it. Even if it's for the looks of it. And according to the, um, uh, some criteria said, they will have different levels of sanitation and then those badges should be promoted via the website, via the various OTAs and wholesalers in order that people will feel confident that that's where I want to go, that's what I want to see, or whatever. Yes, those are the, those are the things I'm talking about, the next step. Now, uh, uh, second thing you said is about domestic tourism. Domestic tourism has been, we tried it for the last, I've been in the industry since 1980, 40 years, okay? We've been trying domestic tourism for all these years. Yes, it's a good way. Yes, it's something that we need to, but no hotel can survive with domestic tourism unless if it's an agri-tourism or if it's whatever. We are not talking about the resorts or the city hotels that will suffer right now, you need to, we need to reopen this and not create more fear. Right now, what we need is just open up and just give to the people, all the people and ourselves, the feel of security that, hey, we feel secure in order to travel. The airlines, we know everybody's suffering. We are all in the same boat here. Sorry, you're right. You're right. No, no, we are not in disagreement at all. Not in disagreement. It's just what to do now is important, because if you open up too quickly, God forbid something happens, fear would go back ten times. Then more. everything below closes. Oh, yes. will close again. Oh, yeah. So we have yeah. to be very, 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 very careful about this and yeah. very meticulous, very scientific about it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We're, we're in no, agreement. We're in agreement. Over. Thank you, thank both you. of you. We have um, what and I, and I probably pronounced this wrong again, Mo Movie Cop. Maybe you can tell us where you're from and you had a question. Okay, my name is what's the name, Mubika. I am currently staying in South Africa and I'm from Zimbabwe. What I wanted to find out, I've been listening for the past three sessions. So, what adding on to what Lifteria said. any regions that are willing to be, say, experimental region in quotation marks, where we start implementing this um, tourism, sorry, this corona free zones. Because so far we've discussed a lot, like a lot, and then we've come to the conclusion that one, governments are in charge, two, domestic tourism might actually be the only way to go for now, not, not entirely, but for now, to serve tourism. So are there any regions that's, that have the potential to be, say, the experimental phase of all this? That's my question. And uh, I don't know if anyone wants to, uh, uh, Talib, you, can you unmute yourself? I'm sorry, I think I muted you. Yes, there are. Any island country can start declaring itself a corona resilient zone. We call it corona resilient, not corona free zone or safe zone because of legal issues, because anything can happen. If something happens, you can't call it a free zone. So corona resilient zone is mm. better. But the zone can be a mm. whole island, a whole country, or a zone in the, the country. For example, in Jordan, we have the Aqaba, Aqaba region, down the seaside. You could, you could get, for example, uh, uh, Victoria Falls as a, as a region, as a zone. But you have to control entry and exit to that region. And that has to follow certain protocols. Mm -hmm. We wrote a two or three page paper on this. We could very easily distribute it to you. So you could see what, what the concept is all about. There are detailed protocols that have to be designed for this. But yes, there are some examples. Akaba zone, I think uh, Seychelles is declaring itself a corona free zone. Malta is, I know that, as an island. But you could take any, I don't think a country altogether can declare itself a zone because it's too much to do that. And you have you have setbacks. If you can if you can geographically identify a certain zone, certain group of 
beaches, for example, certain group of, of hotels along the beach with all the facilities that are, are with it in a certain area there. You could also choose areas that are near some attractions. Okay. For example, Aqaba is near Petra. So what we're doing is we're declaring Aqaba commercial uh, corona prison. We're designing also trips from Aqaba to Petra. You can't declare Petra, all of Petra. But you could, you could, you could design that trip from there and going back. Designing the trip is also a very important thing because I think tour operators' job now will have to change from the traditional way to following that thing. From the minute you leave your house to the minute you come back to your home, everything will have to be calculated. What's the car you are going to take to the airport? What happens at the airport where you leave? Well, how do you board an airplane? How do you disembark from the airplane? How do you go from that airport of arrival to a taxi? What are the qualifications of that taxi? Then how do you go to the hotel? What do you do in the hotel? The lounges, dining rooms, everything will have to be. Otherwise, people will continue to be worried. If they see the protocols in place, they put their minds at rest. That's the only way that international can get started. It's the only way. And we have to do it between two destinations, no stopovers because the stopover is very complicated. So airlines will have to carry you from point A to point B directly. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Talib. We have uh, Alexandra um, raising her hand. Alexandra, where, where are you from? It's your, your turn. Yes, hello to everybody. I'm coming from Montenegro. And Hi. I just joined the, the rebuilding uh, forum and I really love the idea. I think it's a great idea. So maybe I missed, I'm sure I missed a lot of issues because you guys have been together some time ago, but I'll try to catch up, okay? So I just, uh, I would just like to, uh, to make comment on what Mr. Sergidi said and uh, Mr. Uh, Rifain, okay? Uh, I do, okay, we all know that we have to build confidence, that we have to avoid, uh, to avoid fear and so on. But I think what's missing here is uh, to have practical approach. So this is what I would like to see us doing, okay? Because we know what's going on at the moment in the world. Uh, actually, we know that we don't know much. And this is what we have to live with. But I think at this point, uh, we have to have practical approach. And I don't agree that we should talk about what to do uh, the day after. But I think we should talk what to do yesterday. Because even today is a bit late. And as I'm coming from, uh, I'm marketing and corporate communication expert. I do have marketing consulting agency. And uh, my point is that you should uh, stress out and use the, make the best use of marketing tools. There are plenty of marketing tools, and I don't see that many uh, many um, actors are actually using it. Not in my country, not worldwide. So I think we should make, as, as you already made health protocol, my idea and my suggestion suggestion is that we make marketing strategy protocol so to give to come up with concrete ideas what to do because here uh, we should we should boost actually digital mar marketing we should do social media we have to be proactive there are so so many things that we can do yesterday instead of waiting for the day after so i would I would appreciate if you, if, we, if you could think of arranging the, or creating marketing strategy protocol besides the health uh, protocol field. Very good feedback, Alexandra. Of course, we can only give suggestions. We don't have any power over anyone to, to do anything, but these are good suggestions. And I would invite you uh, maybe to take a lead in this and, and help us because we're only as good as our group is and our ideas is only as good as our ideas and we can help through marketing um, to distribute these ideas to the world and let the world know so we would welcome your participation uh, in this and i think it's, it's good feedback um, now we're a little bit over time already at the end of our uh, extended one hour session here right now if anyone else has uh, anything to say please raise the hand and we'll be happy to give you the microphone um, if there's no one else maybe Tim 
Listen. Thomas. Mr. Uh, yeah, okay, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Actually, I listened to uh, our colleagues here. Some have been emotional and some have been very practical, but again, like what Dr. Uh, Talib said, that uh, this is more of governmental issue at this stage, and it's local government decision. Uh, and uh, uh, I know that IATA is lobbying with all these five organizations. However, as a trade industry and as part of this uh, beautiful group, Rebuilding Travel, what I suggest really, and uh, I would like to say this uh, especially to Dr. Uh, Talib, uh, maybe we have to have like a, a steering committee, Dr. Talib, whereby also we have in, th in this group uh, a certain working group. Okay, certain working group under uh, our uh, groups, a group will be for marketing, a group will be for setting protocols and a group will be for maybe setting a fund for those government, they really anxious and they want to rebuild travel and tourism uh, again, and a technology group. And then we take what is now is output from all those global organizations are uh, involved in the travel and tourism industry, like uh, ICAO, IATA, WHO, SEI, WTO, and then our groups should uh, review all those uh, global uh, uh, decisions or policies or uh, what is ever evolving during this crisis, and then we should develop our own strategic plan, and then, you know, uh, all those working groups as a machinery report to the steering committee, which I uh, suggest that to be uh, uh, chaired by Dr. Talib. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Raid. A, a good idea, and that's actually what our feedback survey is is about at the end to identify uh, those that are interested in going to the next step and actually uh, work with this committee beyond attending our events and hopefully we can put uh, something like this together and i think we got some really good feedback uh, today already um, there is uh, one more request from herbert uh, herbert uh, where are you calling from uh, thank you, Jürgen. I have announced, I've, I've mentioned it very well. Uh, I am from Uganda. Uh, I want to talk about domestic tourism. Um, many people are talking about domestic tourism as the uh, best alternative for the current situation. But from the African perspective and what I've seen with my experience, there are things we are not paying attention to. Travel depends on many factors, including culture. The travel culture may not be um, very common in many countries in Africa, for example. And if it's not a culture of travel, the government policy do not provide culture for holidays, it may not make sense for domestic tourism at the moment. If uh, there are some cultural issues in some countries in Africa, for example, that people in the north might not be happy to travel with to the people of the South because of the cultural uh, civil related uh, differences that have happened in Africa for quite some time. The second thing is the income. Do people have a disposable income to travel? Saving is not yet a culture in many developing countries and yet they have got very good destinations. Uh, infrastructure, do you have the infrastructure? There's a lot of traffic of people from Africa going to Europe simply because of different infrastructure. Because people want, if they have saved their money over time, they want to go and enjoy their money in well-developed infrastructure. What about the pricing policies of governments in the developing world? Do they have pricing policies? Who has a control? It's open market, but someone wants to start business, he spends millions of dollars establishing a hotel. He cannot just get people who come in. You know, they want very cheap service, and you're not making any profit. It doesn't make any sense. It does not work at all at the moment. In fact, like uh, Lefter said, the, I mean, hotels 
in all these countries will never make any profit if they just change over time, I mean, immediately to go into domestic tourism. There are so many things to discuss on domestic tourism. I don't think it can be a solution now in the developing world, maybe in the developed world, where travel tourism has been a culture, there's money, there's disposable income, government are putting in stimulus funds, maybe it can work. But at the moment, it is a big challenge to the uh, developing world. Thank you. Uh, and I think you have a very good point. And uh, maybe we, we leave it with this. Uh, we have a lot of things uh, now uh, to think about. Please uh, give us your feedback. Uh, we are eager to bring this group to the next step. Um, we, yes, Talib. I just suggest something, because I think there is a bit of misunderstanding regarding domestic tourism. Why don't we dedicate our next meeting just for domestic tourism? It's, it's, so it's, a, can, it's a good idea. Um, we, we because, can, because I think, I think we need to talk a little bit more about it. I think the lady that spoke about marketing and, and communication from Montenegro, she's right about this. It's a cultural thing. The, the cultures are changing. People are changing. We need and, to change. And, so uh, let's, yeah, let, yeah, let's, let's dedicate next, next meeting for domestic tourism, if you don't mind. We, we can, to talk about yeah, this. We, we, we can right do time. this. If it's not the next, we may have the next meeting already occupied. Um, but okay. maybe the meeting after this, uh, we should That's definitely fine. put it on, on the calendar. Our next definitely. meeting will actually be on Wednesday at uh, reverse times uh, because we're trying to give North America also the opportunity to participate. I know today we had um, a lot of uh, people registering from Jamaica, St. Lucia, and then I got emails also of this. We didn't realize it's two or three in the morning. So we're trying to make it right for, uh, for the world. So next week we're going to be 12 hours apart. Um, it looks like, uh, Tom, I don't know, you had uh, some... Uh, 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 yeah, again, I, I was just uh, echoing what uh, Taleb was saying. I think, um, I think most of the participants on this meeting are involved in international tourism. My, I am an international tourism organization. I have to accept that, firstly, most tourism in the world is domestic tourism. Secondly, that um, what we're worrying about is people's perception of risk and fear. They are gonna be more prepared to take risks domestically than they are internationally. So if we're gonna see any action, it's gonna start domestically. I think also national governments and the fear is being orchestrated by national governments. National governments are completely relaxed about promoting domestic tourism. They like that idea. Look what is happening in Japan at the moment, where trillions of yen are being dispensed to support domestic tourism. And thirdly, ultimately, um, as international operators, what we do is sell the domestic tourism industry internationally. Yes. People go to destinations to enjoy the taste, the experience, the service economy of the destinations we sell. And that service economy ultimately is contingent on domestic demand. I don't want to occupy any more of your time, but even a dyed-in-the-wool international tour operator like myself has to concede the importance of dom the, the domestic industry. And it may be vital in this, in this crisis. Thank you. Maybe, Tom, there is a way Jürgen, specifically... If you allow... Uh, yeah, uh, give me one second. I have you, Dimitri, but um, I just wanted to get back to the gentleman from Uganda. And Uganda is a smaller country. Domestic tourism, I can see his point, is going to be quite a bit more difficult. Maybe domestic yes. tourism could be defined also as regional tourism, depending where it is. Here in our country, in the United States, we have the same problem here in Hawaii. Um, do we want domestic tourism? Domestic tourism is the entire country, but it's huge. So you cannot really compare it with Jordan or with Uganda. There are probably different type of measurements we should do, just my, my, my two cents. But uh, Dimitris, you, you had a comment. I, I just wanted to compliment what you just said. We are all talking about domestic tourism, but it all depends on geography. US domestic tourism, China domestic tourism, France, uh, UK, Italy, Spain, domestic tourism is very, very different from the Caribbean island, the Greek islands, uh, some of the African small countries. It all depends on economics. South Africa, for example, it will have it, domestic tourism is substantial. In some other countries, it's not. It all depends on geography and economics. 
Uh, so it's not, it it's not domestic against international. It's no, no, really no. about the context where it's happening. Dimitris, do you agree with me that it depends on the level of development of, of, of the country as well? The more developed Absolutely. the country, the more developed domestic tourism is. Absolutely. That's, that's but, why but Europe... It's a, matter of, it's a matter of size as well, Talib. Uh, yes, Rhodes, yes, of course. for example, has got 50,000 uh, 50, uh, inhabitants. Uh, they are not going to travel within that region, okay? No, no, no. Uh, I'm talking about domestic and, and regional. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, you, good. Yoga, could I say two words on, on this? Sure. On this point. I, I believe that the point made by Dr. Rifa is a very, very important point. We should have a session that talks about the reopening and how we reopen. Starting with domestic tourism and then building to regional tourism, you are opening up facilities that have been closed now from for weeks or months. Yeah. So you have to have a phased approach. I know the Seychelles, which is small, we've got hun under 100,000 people, but we've already opened the islands of Prale and Ladig, and people from Mahé, the mainland, are going to these islands that are totally COVID resilient or free, because we are enjoying another island of our own group. But we must appreciate, it is not easy for the big resorts of 300 or 400 rooms to open overnight and to take a phased approach of being open and empty and losing money. So they'll have to adapt themselves by reopening on a phased approach. And what better is to allow the inhabitants of our own islands, our own countries, to appreciate what we offer to the world. They'll become spokesmen and advocate that these facilities are up to standard and that are ready to welcome people. We must look at it in a wholesome manner so that we open gradually, to ourselves, to the region, to the continent, and then on to the world. Thank uh, you, Mr. Absolutely, Anne, I, I can definitely follow you. And it's, it's again, it's kind of the same approach uh, here in Hawaii. We, we just, our governor announced a, um, a four-step approach, and it's exactly the way they're going um, about. Before Hawaii is possibly ready to accept tourism, whether they're domestic tourism from other states, we're doing island tourism, uh, for the first month and a half to really test the waters. And this is, uh, looks like that is an approach to go in, in a lot of regions. We have one more question. I know we're, we're now 22 minutes over our time, but um, Omar, uh, where are you from? You had a question. Yeah, um, <laughs> I'm from Sri Lanka, but I live in Paris and I was working with Dr. Rifai in Madrid. That's right. UNW. We miss you. The first time it's lost is the video. It is for fifteen days. General tourism accounts for sixty percent of the income from tourism. What it comes from international tourism. Definitely this varies from country to country, but it is the some rule for in general. The, uh, the contribution of domestic tourism. On the other hand, you find the numbers, it is estimated that domestic tourism accounts for more than five times international tourism. Now in China, they calculate in terms of percent times and they say now we have 300 billion domestic tourism trips. So therefore it is a vast subject and we have to be careful. I can quite understand that small countries and islands, domestic tourism perhaps contributes only up to 10%. But in general, we have, I, I would be very happy to have a session on the tourism because I feel that the revival will depend enormously on domestic tourism, particularly in developed countries in Europe and in America, for example. So, I, it would be very nice if we could have a session on this. Great. Thank yeah, you. and we'd, we'd, um, I, I agree, and we will definitely uh, make an arrangement for this. Well, it's now uh, 1024 here in Hawaii. I know it's 924 where Tom is. And um, I thank you so much. This was a very interesting session. We had an hour and 25 minutes. So uh, it's hard to keep everything in an hour, but then again, we're not the BBC. So I guess we, we, can, we can go over a time if we need to.
Um, again, thank you for everyone for attending. Uh, please fill out the short survey at uh, the end of this call and uh, we'll be in touch uh, for our next session next week, which uh, will be a 12 hour delayed and on Wednesday. And um, um, again, I will get back to some of you in regards to do some break, breaking out sessions. Uh, we can continue and maybe even get more conversation going here. Um, don't forget to read Etobo News, that's most important. Thank you very much, everyone, and uh, you have a great day. And uh, for our friend in Germany, have a nice uh, holiday. And uh, I see you all hopefully next week or the week after. Thank Mahalo. you, Jürgen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Very good. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank